Hello, everyone. Welcome to our program this afternoon. My name is Kelly Montana, and I'm Assistant Curator at the Manil Drawing Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon to our online program, On Drawing, Fluxus Forms with Natalie Harmon. On Drawing is a new programming initiative of the Manil Drawing Institute that addresses topics ranging from the history, theory, criticism, and materiality of drawing. Leading academics, curators, and experts in the field will be joining us to participate alongside Manil curators like myself, as well as our colleagues in conservation. We kick off this new series with our program this afternoon, and I'm thrilled to welcome Natalie Haran, who is joining me from just across town in Houston. So welcome so much, Natalie. Uh, Natalie Haran is a scholar of modern and contemporary art history and theory with particular focus on experimental interdisciplinary practices after 1960. She is author of Fluxus Forms, Scores, Multiples, and the Internal Network, which we'll be discussing today, which was published by University of Chicago Press in 2020 and was winner of the Terra Foundation for American Art International Publication Grant. She has also authored the book Carl Handel, Knight's Heritage, which came from LAX Art in 2017, and she is on the faculty at the University of Houston School of Art. So I will shortly turn it over to Natalie, who's going to offer a presentation of chapter one of the Fluxus Forms book, which considers a multidisciplinary approach to event scores, a format of performance instruction developed by artists and musicians after mid-century as a key tool in their practice. I will then join her for a discussion of scores in the broader context of the expanded field of experimental notations and instructional drawings in the 1950s and 60s. So for that portion of the program, we're delighted to take your questions. So please submit those at any time as they come to you throughout the program by emailing programs at manil.org. And we'll be checking that and we'll filter in those questions as part of our conversation in the latter half of the program. So I'll turn it over to you, Natalie. Thanks so much again for joining us today. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's a real privilege to be able to present this portion of the book, which I'm doing really publicly for the first time um, under the auspices of the Mill Drawing Institute, which has been such an incredible supporter of drawing in Houston and further afield. Um, so let's see, let's start with the next slide. Um, so just to say a few things about the book in general, this is a book about Fluxus, which is an international neo-avant-garde art collective that was officially founded in West Germany in 1962, but then grew to have centers in New York, Amsterdam, the south of France, Japan, and elsewhere. And the book is looking at the different uh, forms and formats developed by Fluxus artists. And the major ones include scores or what the Fluxus artists refer to as event scores. Um, you see some examples of those on the left with George Brax Water Yam, as well as a related format of multiples, these kind of game-like kits that were very tactile and at times sold alongside uh, Fluxus concerts of performance art. So you see a classic flux kit multiple in the middle, which actually contains event scores within it. And then on the right, a photograph of those multiples being displayed at intermission of a concert held at Carnegie Recital Hall in 1965. Next slide. Um, and these are images from the very first Fluxus concert festival that was held in Wiesbaden in West Germany in the fall of 1962. And what you can immediately gather from these photographs is that these artists, some with training in music, many of them without, worked with musical instruments in a very radical, very concrete way. Uh, working in the inside of a piano with common everyday objects, even uh, destroying the piano, pounding it. Uh, famously, they had to drag the piano in pieces uh, away from the concert hall in this case. Um, or if we look at the image on the right, you can see Ben Patterson, the collective's only African-American member who was trained as a classical musician, working his instrument, the double bass, in an extended technique using ready-made objects. And what we have then is an invitation to enjoy these actions visually, 
to enjoy them sonically, and really um, by extension to appreciate the visual and sonic possibilities of everyday objects and actions. Next slide. Um, Fluxus artists' use of scores as a major format or tool or technique in their practice led me to look more closely at their musical influences, which is why the material I'm presenting today is chapter one of the book, um, looking particularly at the experimental composer John Cage, who taught a number of Fluxus artists in his experimental composition courses at the New School in New York in the late 1950. And it was in this period that Cage composed works that had such a visual appeal that they were eventually exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art as part of Bernice Rose's landmark exhibition, Drawing Now, which you see an image of here. So the uh, works on the left-hand side of the wall there are actually framed pages from one of scores, uh, one of Cage's scores, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about today. Next slide. And Cage, of course, was not alone. He was part of a cohort of experimental composers all working toward the dismantling and reconstruction of scoring languages in the 1950s, which is what I wanna talk about really, how this group of composers of music, Cage along with colleagues Earl Brown, Morton Feldman and others became drawers or drafts people and how their drawing like scores inspired visual artists to think more like musicians to very radical effect in both spheres. And the emergence of graphic notation can be traced to one particularly momentous exchange that occurred in December, 1950. The setting was, the, um, was John Cage's top story loft near the Lower East River, sparsely furnished with one couch and a grand piano, a carpet of straw matting on the floor and nothing on the walls all the better to draw attention to the enormous windows with their views onto the surrounding urban landscape. You see Cage um, in the photograph on the left, um, seated at his piano in his own home, surrounded by plants. Um, and of this moment, Cage tells this story, and I quote, Morton Feldman, who also lived in the building, went into the room with the piano, and I stayed at my desk, which was in the bedroom with David Tudor. Shortly, Morton Feldman came back with his first piece of graph music, where on graph paper, he simply put numbers and indicated high, middle, and low, how many high notes, how many middle notes, how many low notes, and nothing else. There were squares of the graph that he left empty, so there, was, so there were no notes there at all. After he showed it to me and to David Tudor, David Tudor went to the piano and played it. It was a great experience. Next slide. What Feldman composed that day became Projection One, the first of a series of scores that used gridded paper as the support for a new kind of graphic notation made from swaths of unspecified pitch and dynamics ranges. The first modern notion of its kind, precise pitch choices were left to the performer's discretion so long as they maintained in sum the basic relationships set forth in the score. The work's very title suggested there were various possibilities for its interpretation, recognizing that any performance would simply be one projection of how to realize the structurally coherent score. A daring provocation in its time, boxes like the ones Feldman composed with here have by now been incorporated into standard musical notations as the very symbol of indeterminacy. Drawn around segments of notes, boxes indicate sections of the music open to improvisation or the performer's choice. Next slide. After Feldman's initial spontaneous gesture in Cage's loft, he continued to hone his thinking about the graph pieces, composing the similarly notated projections and intersection series in the years up to 1953. From 1958 to 1967, he composed another burst of graph pieces. Feldman's process was a kind of schematic mapping of the musical work that he described in remarkably visual and plastic terms. He called them rhythmic shapes or time shapes. He described them in terms of touch, frequency, intensity, density, ratio, color, claiming it's just the spatial relationship and the density of the sounds that matters. Complaining that staff notation was too one-dimensional, like painting a picture where at some place there is always a horizon, Feldman worked by mounting pages to the wall in order to contemplate his composition visually and holistically, as if he were composing an all-over painting on canvas. 
His stated intention was to erase virtuosity, to do away with everything but a direct action in terms of the sound itself. And with this emphasis on immediacy, Feldman provided only brief explanatory instructions for these pieces, erroneously presuming that matters of interpretation would be implicit in the score and thus charging the work with a dimension of ambiguity that was in fact later deliberately amplified by artists associated with Fluxus. Next slide. Feldman's New York School colleague, Earl Brown, quickly advanced on Feldman's breakthrough in a series of graphic notations that began with October 1952 and November 1952, which you see here. These first scores lacked both cleft signs and bar lines, making them scalable to any extremity of time or pitch. In the performance note for November 1952, where you see staff lines have been multiplied into this kind of grand weft of horizontals, Brown explains either space, vertical or horizontal may expand, contract or remain as it seems to be here. Next slide. And so what came next famously pushed the idea of scalability to its very limit. According to Brown's prefatory note for this score, December 1952, the composition may be performed in any direction from any point in the defined space for any length of time and may be performed from any of the four rotational positions in any sequence. The score is a scattering of horizontal and vertical lines of varying thicknesses, the placement, direction, length, and width of which were determined using random number tables. So each mark or element, as Brown called them, signifies multiple dimensions of sound at once, pitch, duration, and volume, all made relative within a unified structure readable from any direction. Brown called this score a sonic image. The piece is not composed, he explained, rather suggestions of relationships are all that is given. Next slide. So faced with the radically unconventional nature of graphic scores like December 1952, critics grasping for precedence turned to the history not of music but of abstract modern art from Paul Clay to Pete Mondrian to Juan Miro. Brown, however, referred to see his method as constructivist, connecting his work to a tradition of abstraction linked to notions of concretism or the concrete. Indeed, that December 1952 can be read in any direction indicates a connection to L. Lazitsky's prototypical constructivist artwork, The Prown, which is rotatable for viewing in any direction. The Prown, which took its name from the Russian acronym for Project for the Affirmation of the New, offered nothing less than a revised perceptual order to replace the illusionism and pictorialism of easel painting. For Lazitsky, the fact that the abstract compositions of his mentor, Kazimir Malevich, were meant to be displayed on a fixed axis problematically implied the existence of a horizon line, even if it was not depicted. By contrast, the Prown modeled a constructivist vision that would take into account the extensions of real space. Lazitsky proclaimed, it has become a construction and like a house, you have to walk around it to look at it from above, to study it from beneath. And similarly, similarly um, December 1952 could be entered into from any direction and moved through visually, emphasizing that our eyes and their scanning of this work are likewise proceeding through a kind of multi-dimensional space. Next slide. Um, and so in my book, I was really proud to um, unearth this original drawing thanks to the Earl Brown Foundation for Brown's score. This is the illustration of the work that's included in my book so that you can really see this as a visual and material object. You can notice um, the measured axes on the left and bottom, which helped Brown place these elements um, in this kind of imaginary grid, as well as I want you to notice his signature um, on the bottom right, really kind of claiming um, an identity as a musician, but also a visual artist um, in rendering the work in this way. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the drawn score or the score drawing was backed by the belief that it offered a more direct or concrete relationship to sound. Feldman linked his embrace of graphic notation to the milieu of gesture painting. He said, the new painting made me desirous of a sound world, more direct, more immediate, more physical than anything that had existed heretofore. Feldman's graph scores were drawn out of a desire not to compose, but to project sounds into time, free from a compositional rhetoric that had no place there. Freed as they were from the standardized alphabet of metrical notation, these scores are not really compositions at all, Feldman said. One might call them time canvases, in which I more or less prime the canvas with an overall hue of the music. And Brown, speaking on his work leading up to December 1952, recalls, I wrote in a graphic line drawing style very rapidly. This was an attempt at correlating my own conception with an extremely rapid way of composing, which was, I, as I have said, almost like improvising myself. In other words, realizing a graphic drawing in my own way. So these composers believed that to draw a score as opposed to writing it out using a pre-existing symbolic language would counteract the score's mediating role and in turn lead to a more direct performance experience in which the performer would have more input as to the work's final outcome. And in later decades, graphic notation was increasingly recognized by the art world as a compelling genre of drawing. For example, when framed pages of Cage's score, Concert for Piano and Orchestra, were included in that 1976 MoMA exhibition drawing now, which I showed an image of earlier, alongside works by Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Klaus Oldenburg, Donald Judd, Dan Flavin, Saul Lewitt, Hannah Darboven, and Bruce Nauman. Next slide. And graphic notation then was absolutely galvanizing, um, as I argue in my book, for a younger generation experimenting with visual art and performance on the fringes of the New York art world. To honor this influence in 1958, Rauschenberg Johns, alongside um, fema filmmaker Emil D'Antonio, organized a retrospective concert of Cage's work held at Town Hall in New York. And concurrently, Stable Gallery mounted an exhibition of individual pages from Cage's scores, including water music and con concert for piano and orchestra. And this concert and exhibition were attended by current and future students, including Alan Caprow, the inventor of happenings, and George Brecht, who would play a central role in Fluxus. Um, and so what you are looking at here is a page from the solo for piano, component of Cage's Concert for Piano and Orchestra, which alone is a monumental feat of graphic invention. In it, 84 different forms of invented notation are parceled out over 63 pages with the instruction that any amount of the score may be performed in any order and that the pages may be read horizontally or vertically, uh, perhaps recalling Brown's December 1952, as we now know. Cage subjects the basic vocabulary of musical symbols here to distortion, dismantling, and reorganization. You see the five lines of the staff are mapped over with organic strata, loose strings, encircling boundaries. Individual notes lose their finials and stems, and they seem to float in space measurelessly. So solo for piano marked Cage's understanding of graphic notation as a process of drawing that in tandem with other chance procedures that he was involved with, provided a means of further severing the composer's control over the performed work's final sonic form. Now, interestingly, the art critic Dori Ashton reviews Cage's exhibition in the New York Times, and she notes that the composer works in India ink with fine pens and compares his scoring practice to a kind of calligraphy. She wrote, each page has a calligraphic beauty quite apart from its function as a musical composition. In all of the manuscripts, there is a delicate sense of design at work that transcends the purely technical matter of setting down music. So if to interpret Cage's scores as visually compelling drawings may constitute a kind of disciplinary transgression, it was precisely his transformation of musical notation from a technical language attached to a specific discipline into 
an iconic pictorial one that prepared his work to be accepted more readily by visual artists. So I would say Ashton's characterization of the work was not far-fetched. Cage and Feldman were known to discuss in detail what kind of pens they used to draw their scores. And according to Cage, however tongue in cheek, he said, uh, Bob, Bob Rauschenberg said at the time that he hoped I wouldn't become an artist because I could be a threat. And not long after this, the Fluxus artist George Brecht sketched out an event score for inclusion in a gallery exhibition, taking care to note that the entirely text-based composition that he had written should be written um, in India ink and framed for this exhibition. Uh, next slide. So Cage's score drawings demonstrated that the drastic reduction of sound to its most basic um, inherent qualities freed from the armature of tonal structure and the teleology of musical narrative would have to be notated with the most basic elements of drawing. The graphic equivalent of an individual sound would be a point extended through time, point became line. The correspondence between sound and the graphic mark had already been theorized for the visual arts in Vasily Kandinsky's 1926 treatise, Point and Line to Plane, a text Cage may have come to know through Galka Shire, a patron and dealer of Kandinsky whom Cage had befriended in his early years in Los Angeles. And an English translation of Kandinsky's text was published in 1947 by Hilla von Ribe on behalf of the Guggenheim Foundation's Museum of Non-Objective Painting and, was, and its intended audience was the abstract painters of Pollock's generation. So Kandinsky's study of pictorial elements begins with an examination of the point described throughout his text as a beat or a sound and the point for Kandinsky is that the, this basic element is, is basic not only to painting, but to all art forms, including dance, architecture, and music. And he therefore provides diagrammatic translations representing each discipline. We see bodies, buildings, and metrical notations transformed into scatterings of points like you see here. Um, in several pictorialized versions of passages from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, Variously sized points accompanied by these kind of linear arabesques indicate rhythmic and dynamic emphases. Uh, next slide. And so later scores by Cage, including Aria and Water Walk, which you see here, verged fully into drawing through remarkably similar notations. In the vocal piece aria, fragments of lyric text are accompanied by drawn lines approximating pitch progressions, uh, which recall neumes, these shorthand-like graphemes that were introduced in the ninth century to record pitch patterns as they were chanted by liturgical choirs of the Roman Catholic Church. And Water Walk up top was a theatricalized adaptation for Italian television of Cage's earlier work, Water Music at Wright whose score was designed precisely to be displayed as a poster during performances. And um, the later version incorporated uh, drawn renderings of the piano and some of the props to be used, as you see um, in the score for Water Walk. Now, curator and historian of drawing, Catherine DeZager has written on the relation of drawing to the articulation of form, explaining that the drawn line is not necessarily in the first instance a registration of cognition, communication, or even draftsmanly craft, as art history might have us believe. The arrangement of lines to determine form delineation is much older than its companion perspective, Dezega writes. While perspective deals with the placement of objects in space, delineation deals primarily with analogy, the representation of objects as such, not as they appear in space. The embrace of delineation's mode of signification by means of direct part-by-part -part analogy to the depicted object was precisely how graphic notation was mobilized as a new kind of transitive musical form in the 20th century, and both Kandinsky and Cage understood this. Delineation produces form in its most basic sense. An individual point becomes a discrete sound, a wavering line becomes a melody, and as such, Proportional graphic notations such as Feldman's projections and Brown's December 1952 marked a limit of simplicity in experimental notation. The conflation of space and time, 
the idea that so much space equals so much time, which uh, was something that Cage often told to his students, uh, was coupled with a push toward concretism that brought the score back to its most basic function of demarcating a set of tones in relationship to one another against a rather flexible pitch and time space, which in the works we have looked at so far becomes one and the same with a piece of paper, the very support of drawing. Um, next slide. So Cage's version of experimental music ultimately came to reject predetermined arrangements of both musical and graphic form altogether. And beginning with the composition of Variations One in January 1958 that you can see here, he began to break down the graphic elements of notation further than previous compositions had dared. This is a piece dedicated to David Tudor, Cage's most trusted performer. And the score, as you can see, consists of transparent squares that are printed with points um, and lines of and points of multiple sizes. And it's really more of a tool for creating a score than a fixed score itself. Um, so we, here we see the language of graphic notation um, really shattered, I would say. Um, so one would arrange the transparencies and then you would measure the distance between points and lines and thereby come up with a set of numbers that following Cage's constructions could be translated into notes that could be played. Next slide. And so from here, graphic notation in form and content is taken in a multitude of directions by the generation of artists influenced by Cage and his peers, many of whom would become involved in fluxus like Lamont Young, who becomes interested in the singularity and intensity of the line. And I would argue that all three of the pieces you see here, there are two, um, one above the other on the right, and then on the left are all variations of a line or a drone or a tone or a gesture um, held for a long period of time. Next slide. And here we see on the left, the Korean Fluxus affiliate and video artist Nam Joon Paik's radical interpretation of Young's uh, score, Draw a Straight Line, that shows a continued interest in indeterminacy, ambiguity, and collective authorship, along with their related challenges, of course. Um, in works like these, there can't really be a wrong performance as long as you're following the score, but there may be arguably a better or worse interpretation depending on who is judging, which is one thing about these scores that fascinates me. Next slide. I also want to show you this work from Dick Higgins' Graphist series. Higgins was a, a major Fluxus participant, a poet, the founder of Something Else Press. This is a score that is meant to be inscribed directly on the performance surface and the performers would follow the lines and then interpret each of the words as you come across them in the score. Um, I very much enjoyed a recent performance of this piece, a realization of it by the Houston based new music ensemble Loop 38, who did a wonderful, wonderfully carnivalesque uh, job. Uh, next slide. And then if we look at the graphic scores of the leading Fluxus organizer, George Machunas, you can see um, that he uses the tools of bureaucracy, the spreadsheet, to set up a kind of do-it-yourself graphic composition um, here titled Solo for a Sick Man, where the chronically ill body is used as a kind of concrete instrument. Um, the body becomes an instrument in a composition that is on the one hand absurd and hilarious, but also potentially devastating and certainly takes on new meaning within the current pandemic. Next slide. Um, and this other version of a graph score by uh, Machunas shows you how the score would be filled out. So um, you can sort of choose the gestures that you want to make and then you fill in the time brackets and kind of build out this do it yourself score. Next slide. Um, and finally, it, 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 for my presentation for the moment, I wanted to just end with this work by Benjamin Patterson from an artist booklet called Methods and Processes, which is another work that in some way similar to Machunas thinks about the regulation of the body. Um, here, uh, Patterson is pairing absurd textual instructions alongside photographs of figures who are hemmed in measured and controlled by arrows. And um, here we have a great example of a Fluxus graphic score 
that is as much a collage or a drawing to be appreciated visually as it is a score that can be performed. Um, so that those are my formal remarks. Um, thank you for your attention. And I'm so excited now to be in conversation with you, Kelly. Natalie, I enjoyed that so much. I'm just swimming with things that I want to talk about. I think there's so many wonderful threads that that and even that introduction just gives a, our audience a sense of of I think the magnitude of what of what this adds to how we think about um, this body of work and this group of artists. Um, what I was thinking we'd start with is that I'm I'm really curious of. Um, just to kind of drill down on some of these images and like really just sort of understand how they came together. Um, so what I think I wanna do is, I think maybe a good way to do this would be to start with, maybe to start with this one um, to kind of go through them a little bit because I think what's also helpful with this one is that the one that's labeled, the, the score here that's labeled B seems to have a more, a more present connection to standard, what we might think of as standard notation. You know, it has it has the staff lines, it has marks that have clefs and finials and things like this. So I think it's just sort of useful for our audience to sort of start with this. That this is sort of the baseline that a lot of these artists are working against in this in this horizon in this horizon line. Um, so the image that we're looking at here, this is from a document that would have circulated right to to composers. So this is the published form of this, I guess, is what I'm asking. It is. And one of the things I learned in kind of putting together the illustration program for my book is that uh, there's more work to be done on the lives of these scores as material objects. So in the earliest printings of these scores, many of which you can still find in your music libraries, um, we have this score at U of H, for example, it comes in a box mm -hmm. and scores are printed on a really nice cardstock. So you can almost shuffle through them um, like a deck of, like a giant deck of cards um, and you can play them in any order the interpretation is somewhat loose. Each of the, the letter keys corresponds to a short instruction that exists in a kind of prefatory note or table of contents in the beginning of the score. So you could look at the instruction for A and it would give you a kind of framework for interpreting that A component. Mm -hmm. um, but I recently reordered the score because you can still purchase these. They The publisher continues to print and distribute them. Um, and the quality and you know the quality in which they're produced nowadays i would argue is is a bit inferior um, and of a different quality and um, i think that says a lot about how we still think of these scores as really um, immaterial texts and it's really more about transmitting information but mm -hmm. my argument really in the book is that these are artworks um, and they're they are object-like and they ought to be honored and appreciated as much. So it does make me happy to see these types of materials um, entering museum collections, special collections of libraries um, with greater frequency because um, they are becoming rarer, you know, given that they're not produced to that same kind of 1950s mm -hmm. theater. Um, and, and so in that sense, they need to be protected or maybe treated as a kind of originary um, object that should be preserved okay. in a particular way. Certainly. Well, and then to that end, I'm going to flip through, apologies to our audience if this is, induces a bit of seasickness for me to flip through these. But following on that topic, I would love to introduce um, this work to our conversation. So this is actually a John Cage score that's held in the Manil collection. Uh, more research needs to be done on this to understand how it kind of fits into the lineage that, that you've laid out, Natalie. But um, I think it would be interesting for the exact reasons you discussed to maybe delve into this one a little bit and we can just do kind of a, a cursory visual analysis to, we just looked at, you know, 
a version of a John Cage score that's been published and circulated that is available for purchase for people to receive on cardstock and use as a, as a performer. But we're looking at something here that fits more into um, what you mentioned of what is the originary document and how are they treated and what do they look like? So to that end, what we're looking at here is a graphite on paper um, event score by John Cage. Um, one, of the thing, one of the things that I first noted about this that's interesting in relation to some of the other scores that we've looked at, ones that are done on gridded paper, for example, or um, ones that use kind of inherited charts or blank pages as this one, is that Cage has actually drawn staff notation on, onto this blank sheet of paper, whereas staff notation is presumably, blank staff notation is presumably something he would have had access to. <laughs> So that's a really interesting sort of starting, starting pass at this. Um, so I see a few marks on here that start approaching to resemble standard notation, but they go, they go off track pretty quick. So I'm seeing here kind of squiggles, some of the kind of the, the note, um, what are the, what did you call them? What he drew on the uh, walking water score? The nooms? The nooms, yeah. So there's nooms on this. That's right. Yeah, if you look above the staff um, on all uh, the top three staffs, you see nooms um, indicating a kind of a kind of inviting the performer to sort of do a pitch progression that approximates the movement um, of the line, which arguably brings us back to Kandinsky. What we really ought to have is a bassoonist or a saxophone player uh, join us to talk about this piece um, and. I mean, I have to admit to my limitations, I am trained as an art historian, I'm not a musicologist, but I tried to take that on in the book project as, I tried to turn that weakness into a kind of strength and to argue that there is actually a visual interest in these scores, as Dory Ashton argued, um, that kind of exceeds their technical um, utility as a, as a thing to be performed. But um, I, I would, um, I think, I think we can fairly say that one of Cage's inspirations for working with a blank piece of paper here might have been so that he can fit all of these uh, kind of extraneous marks into, into his staff. So you, you notice that, um, you know, as compared to a regular kind of blank staff that a composer might use, there's a lot of empty space here that he can fill with all of these marks. There are notations to, and there's these little textual notations telling um, the wind players like how to how to uh, how to use their lips or how to move their lips. Um, and one of the things that I was struck by were all of the numbers here. So one kind of background context to know about this piece is that this is part of the concert for piano and orchestra. It's the saxophone slash bassoon part. Um, so it's really the the piano solo that has all the you know really wild graphic notations that we were looking at. And some of the other pieces for these other instruments are a bit more conventional looking, but um, what's radical about them is that we do not have any bar lines. We do not have any of those vertical lines that would really um, kind of mo modulate and really um, carefully time the piece and really give it a, a, like a metronomic kind of regularity. Um, and it was really up to the performer to decide the pace at which this piece moved. And so my, my, um, my guess would be that these numbers refer to or kind of suggest a measurement that the performer could take on. So maybe three is three seconds. Maybe it's three minutes. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's three milliseconds. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so to that, to follow up on some of the things you got into earlier, it's really, you know, this is this is a living document. I mean, this is sort of one aspect of what of what it's like or its way of being in the world. It's meant to be sort of played and interpreted. Um, and we have it here in the Manil framed <laughs> and, and in storage. And so it's just for me, your your text just raised so many interesting questions about the relationships these have to drawing, but also how drawing as a singular lens on these works is is very limiting. It's very limiting to their potential and how they're sort of meant to meant to disseminate and how they're meant to relate to artists and performers, et cetera. So it raised 
it raised really um, critical questions, I think, for not just drawing, but also kind of how we how we build upon such a collection like this. Um, you know, because drawings or these scores are, to your point, I mean, I think you found a lot of these just hidden away, a lot of the originals hidden away in like libraries and archives, right, that had never really been sought after since they were available and published in published form, right? That's right. The the Feldman sketch was a really exciting find in the David Tudor papers. And I'm not the first to come to it, but um, mm -hmm. myself and the musicologist Brett Bootwell around the same time um, pu were publishing this image. So um, yeah, it's really exciting to see the kind of, you know, the the these are sketches. I think it's fair to call them sketches um, behind the composition of pieces that we often encounter in a kind of computer computer printed format. And mm -hmm. given what we know of the kinds of conversations Cage was having with Feldman and Brown, it's I think it's absolutely okay to um, appreciate uh, Cage's use of pencil here. I mean, his handwriting is very singular. There are other pieces where it gets very elaborate and florid, and you can tell that he's really paying attention to how his marks look on the page. Um, and I would maybe take that back uh, to the field of musicology and to music publishers and argue that um, there is a way that these pieces are supposed to look, and we can't forget that as we increasingly digitize these as texts and as kind of instrumental tools for performance. Absolutely. Um, can I ask you a question, Kelly? Sure. Um, how would you exhibit this work? Do you think that we need, you would want to have an audio component to it? Do we need that? That is a really, that is a very good question. Um, I think about that a lot, um, particularly around, um, you know, we've seen some works in this, you presented some works here that came from the Gil and Lila Silverman collection. And I've, I haven't worked too extensively with their collection of Fluxus works, but I have worked pretty extensively with their collection of instruction drawings. And so I think about that a lot of how, um, what is the balance between a work work like this that we're looking at here standing standing on its own terms but how is it also um impoverished by kind of having its other its other ways of being um presented to a viewer cut off from it so i think for me it would be it's all about context like if there's if i'm doing a show about notation or um you know cage and his circle maybe this work standing on its own makes sense, but I also think having opportunities to contextualize it where the opportunity is there for a viewer to listen to an iteration of this, for example, is, is also important. So I think if it were to stand on its own, it does need to point to its other iterations. It needs to have some, some way for an audience to, and for an audience member to access that as well. Maybe not necessarily in the gallery, but easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, you're making me also think about the the new problems that can be introduced when we do accompany these with recordings. Um, these are indeterminate kind of open form works. They're meant to be interpreted in multiple ways and have a kind of multitudinous kind of sonic identity. Mm -hmm. And if you introduce a, an audio recording, you're sort of saying that this is the realization of the piece. This is what it sounds like. Um, and that is limiting in its own way. Certainly. I, we had a question come in, actually. Maybe this is, a, this is an interesting point to talk about it. Um, someone asked if there's a, a potential for there to be a wrong interpretation of a score and how maybe musicians have responded to that or, or historians or musicologists. Are there good versions and bad versions and what gets maybe codified and what doesn't? Sure. Um, I mean, I could first go back to the Namjoon Paik realization of the Lamont Young piece. So Paik was a very expressive Fluxus performer um, in a kind of uh, a group of artists who typically performed in a very deadpan way, um, a deadpan way that actually had this, this effect of um, creating humor because there was a disjunction between the strangeness of their activity and then the seriousness with which they performed it. 
Um, but Paik was like a very expressive performer in, in ways that were somewhat unlike other Fluxus people. Uh, he once famously cut off John Cage's tie in the course of a performance. So um, his actions were quite uh, extreme, radical, some would even say violent. Um, and so Paik's realization of Young's piece here, uh, dipping his head into a bowl of ink and tomato juice, um, this painting slash drawing actually still exists. It's in the collection of the Museum of Wiesbaden, I believe. But it was so singular that this piece, this performance actually came to have its own name called Zen for Head. So interestingly, it's like a singular gesture that has a double identity as a version of Lamont Young's score, but also as Paik's own unique um, realization. I think there's much more to be said and written about in terms of good and bad realizations. Um, ben Pickett in um, one of his books has a great chapter on um, John Cage's conflict with the New York Philharmonic, um, a group of an orchestra that basically um, refused to do what Cage wanted them to do. And so you had this really dramatic falling out and Ben Pickett, who's a musicologist, really disentangles like the different subjects who are part of that mm -hmm. uh, disagreement. Um, but there isn't enough to my mind written about Fluxus performance and Fluxus scores. And I worry about this because as these artists pass away, as the kind of performance culture and memory of how to do these things you know, kind of recedes into the background and it's not written into the pieces, these very simple instructions, how to do them well, because anyone can do them, but the question is how do you do them well? I think there's a lot of, um, I would call it kind of tacit information that is that is potentially lost to history. So one of the things that I wanna do at some point is write an article specifically about how to perform a Fluxus score, because <laughs> I would argue that there is a right way to do it, because I've seen that, <laughs> not wrong versions, but like right. bad versions, you know, that just don't have the right aesthetic, mood, tone, you mm -hmm. know, there's like a way that you carry your body. Um, there's a way that you move. There's a way that you speak uh, to do these things. And, and, and it's really not anything goes, but the spirit is that anyone can do it. Um, Certainly. It's a par paradox, yeah. Do you have any examples of, of artists um, yeah, or a specific, a specific kind of anecdote you could point to of an artist in this, that kind of through iteration, maybe codified one of these scores a little bit beyond their initial, when they were their initial run, you could say. And could you talk about that in relation to, I think you make really interesting distinctions between things like ambiguity and indeterminacy. And can you kind of Re relate that a little bit to certain artists' perspectives on chance and their kind of and their and their band within it. Sure. So the book opens. The introduction opens with a focus on George Brecht's score, Drip Music, which is a simple score that reads: um, arrange a source of water and a dripping vessel so that the water falls into the vessel. And um, this was performed a lot early on by Fluxus people. And um, Dick Higgins came up with the idea to stand on top of a ladder and pour water into a bowl. And this became a way that Fluxus people would perform this piece. Brecht himself, um, to my knowledge, never performed it in that way, almost as a kind of striking back against this idea that there was um, that you need a ladder. There's no mention of a ladder. In the score. Um, so in that sense, you almost you have the author of the score kind of striking back at the codification of the piece. Um, mm -hmm. And in Brecht's notebooks, we find him thinking about the difference between indeterminacy and ambiguity and really uh, pointing us rather toward ambiguity because the root of the word ambiguere means to waver or to be read in one way. So he's interested in the kind of poetic interpretation of language, the open-endedness of language. And we see that in his text scores. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. So I think we've we've had a lot of discussion about how just singularly focusing on the drawing and the paper itself is, you know, but one lens. So you've provided us today and our audiences with something that I think is really exciting, which is audio samples of a few 
interpretations of one score in particular that um, we've looked at really closely today. So again, this is Earl Brown's December 1952. This is the one that uh, Natalie related to the crown, which can be read in any direction. Um, and each one of these elements, as he called them, is kind of this composite form that thinks about like all sorts of tone and pitch and dynamism all together. So what we would love to do for you all is play a few versions of how this score has been has been performed. And so the first one that we'll listen to here was performed by David Tudor, the um, eminent musician that Natalie mentioned in her in her presentation that a lot of these musicians turn to to um, to perform their work. So uh, please, let's go ahead and, and listen to the first minute of this performance. I love that. It's so spare and you can, in the silences, you can hear the kind of negative space in the score. Um, I don't, I haven't seen video of this particular performance, but just from the sounds, I'm imagining that Tudor is reaching inside the piano. He's plucking the strings inside of the piano or holding strings down inside the piano while he's playing the keyboard. So he's really um, almost in this proto fluxus way, treating the piano like uh, kind of whole concrete object to be, to be manipulated. This like this again, this multi-dimensional space for you to operate within, not just necessarily like just what the keys in front of you in a particular way of, of playing it. That's really fascinating. And I also love this idea of sort of reading, reading the blank space as well and, re and that really becoming a factor into how it's performed. Um, can you just talk a little bit about why David Tudor was so sought after by these musicians? It was really because of his precision, you know, in, in contrast to Cage's kind of horrific experience with the New York Philharmonic. Um, Tudor took this music very seriously. He took its performance extremely seriously. And he brought a level of um, kind of professionalism, professionalism to the presentation of this music that helped sell it to skeptical audiences. And as part of his uh, performance practice, I don't know if he did it with Brown's piece here, but I do know that for Cage's concert um, for piano and orchestra, the solo for piano piece, which Tudor did play, he transcribed um, Cage's graphic piece into staff notation, a version of staff notation that he could then play. Interesting, interesting. Um, let's go to another version here. Could you um, could you introduce this one for us, Natalie? Sure. So this next um, interpretation is by the vocalist Joan LaBarbera, and I just want to invite you to again pay attention to the use of silence or negative space and its relationship to the score. <laughs>
So much more space. Much more breathing room. <laughs> but it also starts with such a such a I mean such a powerful way into it. That's like it's very it's very bracing, and then um, which all the more sets up these these silences and these these pauses and breaks. Um, we're coming up against our hour, but we got I mean these are amazing. <laughs> so we got it. We got to do the, the other one we have in here. Um, so this one um, is introduces ele electronics into this, which gives a very different sense of the, the blank space as well. So if we could go ahead and hear that one. It's just incredible as well. Yeah, and in that case, the electronics create a kind of atmosphere that subtends the performance and maybe the, the white of the page is a bit more kind of suffused with this sort of like kind of cloud of um, atmospheric sounds in the background, which is really lovely. Absolutely. And and just speaks to again how there's there's so much richness for to be seen here just on the page, but also they're constantly pointing to these other these other fields or these other um, kind of visualizations or sonic visualizations that you that attend that attend these works. So um, yeah, and if I if I may, um, one of the quotes in my book that I love so much is Carl Heinz Stockhausen talking about this kind of notation, almost like a crystal that with each performance, you're sort of like turning the crystal, the musical work around in your hand and seeing it from different directions. So obviously the three pieces we just listened to are radically different, but what I want to invite you to think about is the ways um, in which they're actually similar, you know, the kind of striking of, of tones, the breathing, the kind of silences in between, that there's a, there is, a kind of identity to the work that maintains over different interpretations. Well, Natalie, thank you so much. This has been just an incredibly rewarding discussion. I'm so pleased that you were able to join us today. Um, for any of you that are tuning in today that are interested in purchasing Natalie's book, Fluxus Forms, we do have it available at the Manila Bookstore, and I really can't recommend it highly enough. It, subsequent chapters delve into the relationship that Fluxus has with abstract expressionism, with objects that they made that relate to these scores. It's a really, it's a really fascinating read. So the Manila Bookstore is currently open with limited capacity, should you be interested in picking up a copy in person or you can also email bookstore at manil.org to place an order for curbside pickup or um, to have it mailed to you. Um, I would like to remind and invite everyone to tune in to our next program. It's going to be held from April 7th to 9th. At the, um, we'll be organizing it here at the Manil Drawing Institute, and it's a three-day symposium on Italian drawings from the 20th century in conjunction with our current exhibition, uh, Silent Revolutions, which will be on view through April 11th. So, uh, pop by and have a look uh, if you haven't had a moment to see that exhibition yet. And you can visit manil.org for more information and to register for that symposium as well. So thank you again, Natalie. Thank you again, everyone. It's been such a pleasure to have you here today. And we will see you again soon.